I want to thank you all for being here. I especially want to thank uh, James Crabtree for putting this topic on the agenda at the Shangri-La Dialogue. My, my name is William Alberg, and I'm the director for the International Institute of Strategic Studies on strategy, technology, and arms control. Uh, I took over this program uh, um, two years ago uh, when it was the uh, nuclear program and non-proliferation, and I wanted to change it to name it after the famous book by Tom Schelling and Morton Halpern, uh, Strategy and Arms Control. Uh, but we had to throw technology in there too, so it's got a nice acronym, Stack. It's, it's, it's a good program name. Um, but part of the reason I wanted to call it this is because we do have a return to great power competition in a way that is very reminiscent of the Cold War. And I would say the way the nuclear portfolio is going as well, um, uh, it does feel a little bit 1961, a little bit pre-Cuban Missile Crisis in terms of the risks. Um, we have an excellent panel for you t today, and uh, the panel uh, includes um, General Sahir Shamshad Mizra, Mirza, sorry, uh, the chairman of the Joint Staff Committee of the Pakistan Armed Forces, uh, to my left, to my right, um, Minister of Defense from New Zealand, Andrew Little. On the end on the left, uh, Kim Gun, the Special Representative for South Korea um, on Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs. And uh, on my right, uh, Assistant Secretary General of NATO for Defense Policy and Plans, uh, Angus Lapsley. And that is also the order with which they will speak. I will give some framing comments. We'll turn to them for what we call five minutes, probably a little bit longer than that. Um, then I'll ask some questions, and then we'll open up uh, to all of you to, uh, to ask questions. Please note that the special sessions are on the record. This is not the Chatham House rule, so you can be quoted uh, directly. Uh, and with that, let me go ahead and start the introduction. So again, the nuclear issue, to have that on the agenda here is truly um, uh, an honor for me because this is obviously an issue that I've been wrestling with for decades. And we are in a situation where, you know, to sum up the recent developments on nuclear weapons, on nuclear, on the potential for nuclear war, on nuclear proliferation, uh, would take most of the session. It's just an extraordinary list of issues coming to the forefront, and some of which have parallels in the Cold War, and some of which have really no parallels in history. And all this comes as the dark shadow of nuclear weapons are lengthening over this region in particular. I note in a piece that we published to prepare for this event that six nuclear armed states call this region home, uh, the US, Russia, China, North Korea, India, and Pakistan, and two more have a legacy presence here, France and the United Kingdom. And in the context of Russia's uh, illegal war in Ukraine, uh, where it has issued regular nuclear threats and has used nuclear-capable missiles with an extraordinary frequency to varying degrees of success with conventional warheads, and now has made the announcement that it will forward base nuclear weapons on Belarusian territory. Uh, those storage facilities in Belarus are supposed to be done on the 1st of July. In the meantime, China is building up its nuclear arsenal, building up and building out with more capable uh, ICBMs, sub-launched ballistic missiles, heavy bombers, uh, medium-range missiles, a full suite of nuclear capabilities, while it is also ramping up its capability to produce plutonium. A recent purchase from Russia for a long-standing contract to provide highly enriched uranium to plutonium production reactors is notable in this regard but with a degree of opacity. We don't know how many nuclear warheads they have or how many delivery systems. Um, of course, North Korea uh, building an incredibly diverse uh, range of nuclear capabilities, battlefield nuclear capabilities, uh, and very, very long range nuclear weapons, um, forcing South Korea to think about conventional deterrence against a nuclear armed neighbor. Iran is uh, just a matter of time away from a nuclear weapon now, having mastered all the parts of the nuclear weapons production process. Uh, they have yet to cross that threshold, we believe, but they have the capability now and they have the delivery systems ready built. India and Pakistan, um, uh, a particular nuclear dyad um, where um, 
relying on confidence building measures uh, that have not always worked. Um, geography and history leave them uh, locked in a potential conflict and nuclear rivalry. And of course, India also um, issues with China. Uh, it remains to be seen if China builds up its arsenal to a much larger level, will the, how will the United States react in the context of the end of US-Russian arms control? Um, how will India react to China building up? How will Pakistan react to India? It's all in just an incredibly complex situation. And so I'm going to look to my panelists to, to give us solutions. Yeah, I'm sure you have the answer to how to solve these nuclear conundrums and make the world a safer place. Um, and I'm going to start uh, with you. Uh, Joe Minister, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <clears throat> Thank you, William. And ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to speak to this August forum. <clears throat> I would like to offer my compliments to the International Institute of Strategic Studies, where two decades of Shangri-La Dialogues pro success is itself a testament of your contributions towards regional peace and stability. Ladies and gentlemen, today I will dilate upon nuclear dimensions of regional security a topic being close to my heart. I will make brief propositions on the security in the Asia-Pacific region in a way that first, I shall give you an environment scan with focus on its impact on security of Asia-Pacific region and beyond. Then I shall cover the changing role that the nuclear dimensions and related technologies are playing. And in the end, I will give certain concluding thoughts, especially on the prospects of arms control in the region and beyond. In the global scan, ladies and gentlemen, today we see <clears throat> that the world is undergoing a transition, mainly what I say in four dimensions. First, there is a shift from unipolarity to multipolarity. Secondly, there's a, the primacy of geoeconomics is somewhat under stress. There is an emergence of great power contestation with emphasis on issue-based partnerships. And finally, we can see that within globalization, enhanced populism is a recent emerging phenomenon. Let us now see the impact of some of these developments on the strategic environment of Asia-Pacific region in general and on the South Asian security paradigm in particular. For the wider region of Asia-Pacific, nuclear dimensions have a peculiar relevance. Firstly, Ladies and gentlemen, this is the only region where these weapons have been used and has suffered the destruction that this contraption causes. Compared to the persistent volatility and inherent risk in nuclear discourse in the Euro-Atlantic context, the three acknowledged nuclear powers of this region have handled their nuclear capability with a high degree of responsibility and care. The past risk record, however, cannot and does not guarantee anything for the future. Secondly, South Asia, which has been part of the traditional geographic notion of Asia Pacific, presents a unique and complex security challenges due to peculiar character of China-India-Pakistan equation. It is the only region where three contiguous nuclear powers share physical borders with alarmingly low warning times between them. This requires a very high level of efficiency and reliability in mutual communication, along with robust command and control structures, especially during times of heightened tension. Like South Asia, Asia-Pacific region resides at intersection of superpowers interests, but the nature of strategic anxieties is different in Asia-Pacific. The strategic competition of superpowers is likely to get intensified in the region, which in turn will implicate areas beyond defense and security to include trade, investments, and technologies. Thirdly, barring some limited externally driven arrangements like CETO in the past and the emerging, emerging AUKUS now, there has been no fully functional security alliance integral to this region. This has already started to change in the form of military pivots to Asia, and nascent understandings like Quad 
and geostrategically inspired geometries like Indo-Pacific seeking to replace the regionally preferred and historically rooted concept of Asia-Pacific. The change is, once again, geostrategically driven. If and when these new configurations solidify, they will inevitably lurk onto the nuclear dimension, I feel, as well. Lastly, the region therefore is essentially emerging as an arena for nuclear security tension between the resident and the non-resident nuclear powers. In the same breath, in my view, strategic developments will have six implications for strategic stability in the region. Firstly, strategic stability is the product of fine balance between deterrence and arms control. It is veering out, especially in the broader Asia-Pacific region. Secondly, regional and extra-regional arrangements will take years to pay dividends for Asia-Pacific balance of power. Thirdly, it would not be wrong if I say that rearmament has become a new normal. Preserving existing arms control mechanisms have become a challenge. Therefore, we ought to devote sincere efforts to reduce nuclear risk, and for this, reselecting arms control regimes seems to me to be the primary panacea. Fourth, we witness an application of non-proliferation regime as a tool to secure foreign policy objectives. Selective application of rule of law will only drift us away from maintaining a rule-based order. Fifth, world and region is ignoring hotbeds of conflict. Conflict management is being preferred rather than conflict resolution. And finally, growing pressure from technological competition combined with decouping in emerging technology sectors poses increasing security risks. Ladies and gentlemen, in Asia Pacific, I would say that due to these significant developments, prospects of arms control in the region are diminished unless major powers move beyond their pledge that since nuclear war cannot be won, it must never be fought. Asia Pacific states must raise the bar through a firm commitment that there is no space for war under a nuclear overhang. Coming over to the role these weapons and related technologies are playing in this evolving strategic environment, nuclear and non-nuclear strategic capabilities are militarizing the foreign policy objectives of the states. In the recent past, the chatter about nuclear weapons has uncomfortably increased around the globe. Conversely, an exponential increase in emerging and disruptive technologies has the potential to substantially alter the geostrategic landscape. With no agreed rules of the game in this domain, it is likely to have a disproportionate effect on the region and beyond. Unless a comprehensive legal regulatory regime is developed, the proliferation of emerging and disruptive technologies could increase nuclear risk. South Asia, <coughs> excuse me, a sub-region of Asia Pacific is also facing the spillover effects, most notably impacting the South Asian power equation. South Asian security, due to its peculiar character, is predicated on long-standing border disputes and thus presents a unique and a complex challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, within the overall geostrategic context in South Asia, the growing conventional asymmetries proportion bears the potential of a strategic miscalculation. This seriously disturbs the strategic balance with attendant implications on the strategic stability in South Asia. The entire context remains incomplete without mentioning the unresolved core issue of Kashmir that today remains a major impediment for an enduring peace in South Asia and probably the most dangerous nuclear flashpoint on Earth. As a Pakistani, my perspective may sound to be different 
due to following reasons. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, our strategic program was and continues to undeniably be need-driven and not prestige-driven. Inexorable circumstances pushed us to the direction of a nuclear program to meet the clear and the pressing need of our national security. Secondly, given our zero expansionist designs, program is totally defensive. Pakistan only responded to earlier neighborhood developments that were related directly to its defense and more importantly, to maintain a strategic equilibrium in South Asia. Thirdly, our program is meant to deter war or escalation of an unintended conflagration. And here I must emphasize that this objective has been achieved repeatedly. Despite the differences, there has been no full-scale war for a quarter of a century now. And even when limited conflagrations in our context erupted, for example, in 1999 and 2019, the awe-inspiring possibility of a nuclear conflict made respective sides pull back from the edge, thus repeatedly augmenting the notion that, as I said before, there is no space for military conflict between two nuclear-armed or nuclear-capable states. Therefore, in all three dimensions, strategic capability of Pakistan has proven the credentials of capability of peace. We understand fully well that for this capability to continue to play that re relative positive role, in addition to continued statesmanship at the policy level, a robust bilateral warning and communication mechanism and a shared understanding of the ravages of the nuclear exchange remains extremely important. Ladies and gentlemen, few concluding thoughts wherein I would say that multilateral plurilateral and bilateral arms control architectures are somewhat under stress around the globe. If the sales of great power strategic competition catch more wind, pursuit of a new rules-based order, reformed multilateralism, and a return to peaceful globalization may become an illusion. Restyling Asia-Pacific and in as Indo-Pacific, emerging military alliances that contain in economic initiatives is somewhat peculiar and unprecedented for the littoral states of the Pacific Ocean. This environment is likely to increase insecurities in the region and push it into an action-reaction cycle and arms racing. Differences and disputes in Asia require Asian solutions on the basis of Asian values and interests. Through strict adherence to the principles of the UN Charter, and the abandoned principles of the peaceful coexistence, thus making this zone an area of expanding cooperation and prosperity. From the nuclear perspective, lesser would be better for the Asia-Pacific. The farther distance the region draws from the rearmament elsewhere, the better it would be. If the power competition intensifies in Asia-Pacific, so shall the arms race and crisis instability. Important stakeholders should find ways to extend both formal and informal rulemaking. Informal agreements at times have been important to regional stability in the past. They can be a part of maintaining stability in the future as well. I strongly believe that dialogue could, should be increased at every official level, as should the semi-official and non-governmental dialogues too. Because at times, the Track 1.5 or Track 2 dialogues become more effective, especially if they have governmental backing and the agenda is consensual. Pakistan is a responsible nuclear state and considers it vital to avoid great power rivalry and tensions in the Asia-Pacific. We have always stood for and played a very active role on issues of arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation. We believe that the principles of equal and undiminished security for all with a non-discriminatory behavior will bring strategic stability, complement arms control, and reduce nuclear risk. Our proposal of a strategic restraint regime in South Asia still awaits a response. Despite technological advancements, one thing that can override 
escalation ladder is re leadership's resolve, behavior, and approach towards conflict, as demonstrated by the Pakistani national leadership in 2019 after the Pulwama incident and the Iran fire of Indian Brahmos missile last year. Ladies and gentlemen, drawing from South Asia's parable, I make two suggestions for the security of Asia-Pacific region. One, our common goal should be to reduce risk of conflict and build strategic stability. Two, to achieve this goal, we must act responsibly, resolve disputes, and meaningfully engage ourselves in arms control. In the end, I once again thank IISS for organizing an extremely intellectual, thought-provoking, and mutually beneficial <coughs> event. I would now be happy to listen to the comments from my fellow speakers in this session and answers any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. Now I would like to turn to the Minister of Defense of New Zealand. Mr. Little, please. Thank you, William, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me get straight into it. New Zealand's most recent defence assessment identified climate change and geostrategic competition as the two greatest security challenges to our place in the South Pacific. On the first issue, partners engaging and re-engaging with Pacific Island countries are finding that climate change is a security and existential threat in our part of the world. As defence leaders, we cannot view climate change as something that only others must grapple with. But today I want to focus on the second challenge, increasing geostrategic competition in the Pacific and Indian Oceans regions. That issue poses significant risks of miscalculation, particularly when nuclear weapons are part of the calculus. A number of issues over many years have converged to heightened tensions in our wider region. These include larger economies significantly growing their military spending and capabilities, intensification of military exercising and challenges to freedoms of navigation, destabilising actions in the South China and East China Seas, rhetoric and actions that might disrupt the peaceable status quo across the Taiwan Strait, a Pacific Rim state, Russia, defying the rules-based international order with its unlawful and immoral invasion of Ukraine, and the development of long-range ballistic missiles by a pariah state, North Korea. Added to that difficult environment, we have the threat of nuclear weapons. We've seen rhetoric around the possible use of nuclear weapons becoming more prominent, including false categorizations of so-called tactical or battlefield nuclear weapons. States in the region adding to their nuclear weapons stockpiles, including North Korea and growing concerns about a deficit of prudent transparency about the real size of those stockpiles. New Zealand's long-standing position on nuclear weapons has no ambiguity. We believe all nuclear weapons should be verifiably and irreversibly eliminated because there are no circumstances in which their use could be morally justified. It's not possible to confine all of the effects of the use of nuclear weapons to a period of kinetic engagement or to a zone of conflict. It necessarily follows that the use of nuclear weapons would also breach the fundamental rules of international humanitarian law. We know this because the South Pacific is where superpowers once routinely tested their atomic weapons. On this issue, my country walks the talk. For 35 years, we have had legislation absolutely prohibiting the acquisition, stationing and testing of nuclear weapons in New Zealand. Nuclear-powered vessels have also been banned in our waters since the Cold War, and this will not change. Like many states, New Zealand has ratified nuclear non-proliferation and test ban treaties. An example of this is the 1985 Treaty of Rarotonga, which established the South Pacific nuclear-free zone and to which we are fully committed. However, it's apparent that international institutions are limited in their ability to act in cases where nuclear superpowers are in conflict. It's also clear that the mechanisms for the management of crises are lacking, let alone the means to facilitate wider strategic dialogue. The failure to fully implement verifiable and irreversible elimination of all nuclear weapons is what prompted New Zealand to negotiate and to join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. 
This is the first global treaty to provide for the total elimination of nuclear weapons, which would provide the only guarantee that they will never be used again. It's not enough to cross our fingers and hope for the best. Rational analysis and cool heads are required in the present circumstances. When we see the rising geopolitical tensions and the limited effectiveness of some international institutions, then we must acknowledge that the presence of nuclear weapons adds a risk of miscalculation that could be truly catastrophic. For small liberal democracies like New Zealand, we do not get to avoid the real life effects of geostrategic competition. Our way of life, including the freedoms we cherish and which are guaranteed to all peoples by the UN Charter, can never fully be safeguarded from the effects of nuclear conflict in a world that tolerates nuclear weapons. But New Zealanders know that our views on nuclear weapons are not shared by everyone. We acknowledge that, in the end, it is for sovereign states to determine how they will ensure their national security consistent with international law. We do not confuse, sorry, do not confuse my country's moral clarity with wishful thinking. So New Zealanders must be prepared to equip ourselves with trained defence personnel, assets and materiel, and appropriate international relationships to protect our national security. And that is what we're doing. We are increasing our military spending and modernising our capabilities across land, sea and air. We have our most precious assets, our people, deployed to hotspots around the world. My country has a range of security commitments and partnerships, not only with our neighbours but also beyond our region. We value the trust our partners place in us and we will uphold our promises to them. And we retain our focus on strengthening multilateral and regional institutions and their role in promoting the safety and prosperity of everyone. These efforts would be strengthened by a nuclear-free region and world. Were it so, then we could all focus on the other pressing security issues we all face, such as climate change. New Zealand's most recent defence assessment identified uh, climate change and geostrategic competition. Uh, sorry, off. Uh, a number of issues. My apologies. Sorry, New Zealand looks uh, clear eyed at the world and our own security. We will stand prepared and will maintain the military capability necessary to contribute to the rules based international order and protection of our free and democratic way of life now and in the future. Thank you very much, Minister. Now I'm going to turn to Ambassador Kim Gun, the Special Representative for the Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs. Yes, uh, thank you for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to join this uh, Premier Security Forum. I see many of you are in uniform, uh, which rem reminds me of my son, who joined the military last year. Do you know who else joined the military recently? Uh, it's Jean and J-Hope of the K-pop group BTS. In 2021, BTS won American Music Awards for the fifth year in a row. Soon after they announced their decision to join the military service. Many fans, of course, were saddened to see their favorite singers leave the stage. But at the same time, many rooted for their decisions. Coincidentally, BTS fans call themselves the army. Korean people learned from its history how sacred it is to serve in the military, protecting the lives of fellow citizens. Over the decades, the ROK has proudly emerged from the ashes of war. However, even after 70 years, we are still faced with an ever-growing threat from North Korea. Since last year, it has launched over 100 missiles, including 11 ICBMs. It adopted the most, uh, most aggressive and arbitrary nuclear doctrine in the world. 10 years ago, at least, Pyongyang said its nuclear weapons are only for deterrence purposes. It also said that they will not be used against their brothers in the South. Now its leader is openly threatening first use of nuclear weapons against us. It emphasizes nuclear weapons as its war fighting capabilities. 
Recently, it disclosed a new tactical nuclear warhead that can be used against us and our neighbors. To slightly tweak a quote from President John F. Kennedy, every woman, man, and child lives under a nuclear sword of Democles. It is hanging by the slenderest of threads, capable of being cut at any moment by the reckless regime of North Korea. The prospect is bleak, to say the least. Just a few days ago, it launched a so-called military satellite. After the launch ends in failure, it declared that it would go for another launch as soon as possible. We must not forget that this is a clear violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. Nine Security Council resolutions prohibit any launch by North Korea using ballistic missile technology. That is why North Korea's launches and its repeated statements that deny the authority of the UN Security Council are a serious challenge to the rules-based international order. Clearly, Pyongyang's false narratives trying to justify its unlawful provocations will fool no one. If North Korea's true objective is peace and stability in the region, the first step should be to abandon its unlawful nuclear weapons and WMD programs. If they get to launch another so-called satellite, its debris may very well fall in the Philippine Sea, not too far from where we are now. We must, we must pull out all the stops to prevent such a scenario. Last December, Pyongyang declared it, declared it is suffering the biggest national crisis. People in North Korea are dying of starvation. Still, they keep draining their scarce resources into WMD programs. Now the big question is why? It looks like they have three motives. First, Kim Jong-un thinks that once he gains the ability to threaten a nuclear strike against the US or any other country in the world, everyone will respect him and listen to him. Before Kim Jong-un came to the negotiating table in Singapore in 2018, he said that nuclear button is on my desk. After no deal in Hanoi, he might have wondered what went wrong. It looks like the conclusion was, I need a bigger button. Last November, North Korea launched its Hwasang-17 ICBM and proudly claimed it developed the strongest ICBM in the world. So I asked our experts if it was true. The answer was, it is not the strongest, just the biggest. Showcasing its triple X large size ICBM might be its way of saying that it now has a bigger button. Second, North Korea seems to believe that tactical nukes can compensate for its inferiority in conventional forces. This explains its emphasis on the operability of tactical nukes. It is highly dangerous as it raises the possibility of actual use of nuclear weapons. It is a direct and destabilizing threat to the ROK and neighbors. Lastly, it is trying to foment crisis for its own domestic political purposes. It is an old playbook of this abnormal regime. In 2012, Kim Jong-un made a pledge that North Koreans will never have to tighten their belts again. We all know that he failed to deliver. deliver. Now Pyongyang is trying to shift the blame to the outside world. It constantly tries to instill the absurd idea to its people that North Korea is the victim bullied by the international community. All in all, Pyongyang continues to mislead its people that nukes can be a magic wand that solves all its problems. Ironically, it is exactly the opposite of the truth. His obsession with nuclear weapons has only shattered the economy, undermined its security, and aggravated its isolation. Then what should we do? The entire international community must unite and make Pyongyang realize that its nuclear ambitions will never get them what they want. 
my government will create a strategic environment that leaves Pyongyang no choice but to return to denuclearization talks. About a year ago, just two months into the new administration, my foreign minister, Park Jin, presented my government's strategy right here in Singapore and named it the 3D approach for the first time. 3D stands for deterrence, dissuasion, and dialogue. First, we will deter North Korea's nuclear threats. The ROK and the US are working together to strengthen extended deterrence as laid out in the ROK-US Washington de Declaration. Second, we will dissuade Pyongyang from developing further nuclear capabilities. We will cut off its illicit revenue streams, which funds these programs, repatriating North Korean overseas workers and clamping down on malicious cyber activities will be our primary focus. In accordance with UN Security Council resolution, UN member states are required to repatriate all North Korean workers. However, a large number of North Korean laborers still remain overseas, whose income is used to fund its WMD programs. As North Korea gears up to reopen its border, we must all be vigilant. On, cyber, on the cyber front, North Korea stole up to $1.7 billion worth of cryptocurrency in 2020, uh, last year alone, according to private industry estimates. Sky Mavis, a Singapore-based game company, also fell victim to North Korea's crypto heist last year. Its hackers stole a record amount of $620 million. In conducting cyber attacks, North Korea does not distinguish friends from foe. In fact, according to the Chinese cybersecurity firm Qianxin, North Korean hackers were responsible for the biggest share of cyber attacks in China last year. A crypto analysis provider Elliptic estimate, is, estimates that North Korean hacking group called Lazarus have stolen $540 million from Vietnam and $8.1 million from Singapore. Last but not least, we will ensure that the door to dialogue and diplomacy remains open. Audacious initiative that my government proposed last year demonstrates our willingness to engage in dialogue. It is regretful that Pyongyang does not heed our repeated calls for dialogue. At the end of the day, one thing is clear. Continuing on the current path will only lead to doom and gloom for Pyongyang. Nuclear weapons was once considered as an old legacy of the bygone days. Many people believed that they would eventually fade away into history. Unfortunately, the world is still under the grim shadow of nuclear weapons. North Korea is absolutely the biggest culprit in the region. Now more than ever, a united and firm international response is needed. We must not relent until Pyongyang gives up its nuclear ambitions. I would highly appreciate it if each and every one of you in this room could echo these messages. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Finally, turn to Assistant Secretary General Lapsley, please. You have the floor. Thank you, William, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so in NATO, the speaking rule is three minutes. So the fact that you've given me five, it's, it's very exciting. Um, and I, I will have to expand to no flashing red light fill the space. Um, but seriously, I am I'm delighted to be here and to, uh, to speak on behalf of NATO on this, on this important issue. Um, and I'm going to build my intervention around three points which might help the discussion we're about to have. Um, so firstly, I just wanted to say something about the uh, character of NATO uh, as a nuclear um, uh, alliance. Um, we are a defensive alliance. We're arguably the most successful defensive alliance in history, and we will celebrate our 75th uh, anniversary uh, next year. And through that time, we have successfully prevented um, uh, armed attacks on our members. Um, we're a regional alliance. We have no mandate, no intent to 
uh, expand beyond the Euro-Atlantic uh, area. And also from our very outset, we have been a nuclear uh, alliance. Um, three of the five um, nuclear states under the Non-Proliferation Treaty are, of course, uh, in the alliance. Uh, and their strategic nuclear forces, uh, those of the US, the UK, uh, and France, they're each distinct in their nature and their capabilities, but they all contribute to the supreme guarantee of our security uh, as an alliance. We also rely on the contribution of a wider range of NATO allies who operate and support um, dual capable uh, aircraft that carry US weapons. And these arrangements, which are part of how extended deterrence works in the Euro-Atlantic space, have been there since the early 1960s. So they predate the Non-Proliferation Treaty and are completely compatible with the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Now, of course, we keep our posture as a nuclear alliance under constant review, uh, and all of our uh, nuclear allies uh, uh, are constantly in the process of modernizing uh, their nuclear deterrence, and that is a major uh, effort. But, and this is my, my core point, core to our character as a nuclear alliance is stability, predictability, and transparency. Actually, you don't need me to come here and explain to you the fundamentals of NATO's nuclear doctrine and nuclear posture, because most of them are public, and we make them public and talk about them on a constant uh, basis. And I would argue, and this would be my sort of first contribution to this debate about what's happening here in Asia, is that that is what responsible nuclear powers do. And that transparency, that communication, that openness uh, is critical both to deterrence, because it means our, uh, any potential adversary knows where we come from, knows what we could do and, and, and where we would stand, but it's also critical to strategic stability. The second point I would make um, is about what's been happening in the Euro-Atlantic area over the last uh, 18 months since the uh, uh, Russian war of aggression was launched um, against Ukraine. Now, I'm not going to dwell on what lies behind that aggression, the cynicism, the old imperial instincts, just the utter brutality of what Russia is doing uh, in Ukraine. But I think for this panel, it's worth dwelling on the role that uh, coercive nuclear signaling has played over the last um, 18 months or so. Now, we've known for at least a decade uh, how much Russia was investing in modernizing and expanding its own nuclear capabilities, um, both its strategic weapon systems, but also its short and intermediate range uh, weapon systems. Uh, and of course, the intermediate range weapon systems that we now know about uh, were illegal under the um, INF Treaty. Um, Russia had also been quite deliberately parading its uh, doctrine of escalate to de-escalate, um, I think as a way of trying to shape uh, uh, how we saw them as a nuclear power. Nonetheless, even though we knew all of those things and we were becoming accustomed and used to them, um, the nuclear signaling that we've experienced in the Euro-Atlantic area over the last 18 months has been unprecedented. Uh, and I think it's been deeply irresponsible. Um, what I'd note, though, is that we in, in the Alliance and in the West have been very careful not to overreact to that signaling. We have been clear throughout that NATO uh, would not become a party to the war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, but we've carefully avoided responding to each and every provocation uh, or statement that Russia has put out. And I think had we done so, we would have actually risked legitimizing and empowering what the Russians were uh, trying to do. So instead, what we've done is stick to the obvious points. We are a nuclear alliance. Uh, and um, as the president of the US has made clear, any use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine would profoundly change the nature of the conflict. And nor have we been deterred from offering Ukraine the kind of um, support that it needs to defend itself, as is its right under uh, Article 51 of the UN Treaty. Now, I raise this because I think it's not an unreasonable conclusion to draw from what we're seeing in Europe, that if a revisionist power equips itself 
with the range of substrategic and tactical nuclear weapon systems that we've seen with Russia, it may have in mind this kind of coercive um, uh, uh, signaling uh, strategy. Uh, in other words, that might become an issue here in Asia as well um, at some point. Uh, and therefore, it's worth thinking quite hard about how do you deal with that kind of situation? What is the, what is the effective way of not being um, uh, shaped by this kind of uh, coercive signaling uh, strategy? The third and last point I'll make is about how we in NATO see the global context, and in particular what's happening here in the nuclear domain in Asia. So the strategic concept that NATO adopted at the Madrid summit last year was clear that our most acute and most immediate threat comes from Russia. Um, we also have to deal with um, the ongoing threat of, uh, of terrorist groups. Um, but it also made clear that the threats that we face or may face are global and interconnected. Um, and as a Euro-Atlantic alliance, we need to be able to see our security against that global backdrop, including what's happening in the nuclear sphere uh, here in Asia. And I think what strikes us most is, and the speakers we've just heard from have brought this out very clearly, is there's a lot happening. And I think the scale and the pace of uh, change in the nuclear sphere um, here in uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific region um, is starting to have a bigger and bigger impact on our thinking um, uh, in the Euro-Atlantic. In particular, we see that China is very rapidly expanding its nuclear uh, arsenal and developing increasingly sophisticated uh, uh, delivery systems. And it's doing so without being transparent uh, and without engaging in a serious conversation about arms control. Now, I say that not to call into question uh, uh, China's right uh, as a nuclear uh, state under the NPT to have a nuclear deterrent and to modernize it and to make sure it's credible for the job that it needs to do. But the scale and the pace of change uh, from China uh, is really striking. Um, and uh, if you accept the, the US assessment uh, of what is happening, uh, the US certainly sees China um, tripling its nuclear arsenal to co close to 1,000 warheads. Uh, by 2030, um, and uh, it could field a stockpile of about 1,500 nuclear warheads by 2035. That is a, that's not just an evolution, that's a very, very major change in the global strategic balance. Um, now, as a global power, China has global responsibilities, um, and Beijing, and indeed all of the countries uh, that are represented here, uh, I think would benefit from uh, uh, more transparency and predictability, and as, a, as actually a number of speakers have already said, um, uh, of engaging in arms control uh, uh, agreements. And NATO remains open to engaging meaningfully in dialogue with China, uh, including on these nuclear um, issues. We also remain deeply concerned about the nuclear programs of both North Korea uh, and Iran. I won't say more about that because it's been covered extremely well um, uh, already. These are not just Asian problems. Uh, these are problems that we worry about on the other side of the world as well. Uh, for the precedents that are being set, uh, for the risks of uh, a conflict being triggered, and a conflict, would have, a conflict with a nuclear dimension on either side of the world would have a huge impact uh, on the other side of the world, whether that's the economic fallout, whether it's the um, nuclear fallout, or whether it's just the, um, uh, the taboo of non-use of nuclear weapons being, um, uh, being broken. So, um, I mean, my prescriptions would be very similar to those you heard from uh, other panel members. Uh, we would encourage this region, like our own region, to work for um, uh, strong deterrence where that is needed. That is always part of the mix. Strategic stability requires clear and strong deterrence, including extended deterrence, but also to work for transparency and understanding um, and to work for arms control um, and to see if we can get back to some kind of arms control dynamic, which we need, again, on both sides of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it does, it, I've, find remarkable through all the talks we just heard, um, there is a common thread that, um, that dialogue is needed, that 
that arms control is needed, I, I wonder if I could ask, uh, in particular, the, the general, um, you mentioned you, you, know, you have a specific proposal, but you also point out that you are in a sort of hub and spoke deterrence situation where you in India, but also India and China. Is there, do you see any possibility for India, China, and Pakistan to have any kind of structured talks, or is, is the only way forward through bilateral proposals and ideas? Uh, thank you, William. I think um, in this nuclear context, in the strategic context, it is purely a bilateral regimes which are there. And Pakistan and India, since our program is uh, one country specific and it is only related to one country, and the mechanisms, of course, directly relate to each other. And that is what we have already been proposing also. We had the strategic restraint regime proposal. We have already had certain CBMs, and we are already on the table. We have about 12, 13 CBMs which await a response. So I think in that matter, uh, the, while we are contiguous, while we are there, but our, uh, our dynamics and our uh, security environment with regards to each other is peculiar. It does become difficult, though, because, for instance, you mentioned strategic equilibrium as an important factor. If India and Pakistan are able to lock in a dialogue, a numbers, restraint, something like that, but India's relationship with China becomes destabilized, how, how would that, how would you take into that into account? Well, that's an interesting question, of course, but um, that is what, of course, uh, the Indians have been repeatedly saying when they say it is beyond extended region, as you know, uh, also. But uh, when it comes to capability orientation, well, it is the capability orientation uh, which speaks by itself. If 80% of the missiles and 80% of the capabilities Pakistan-centric, so uh, I think will it be the numbers that would matter or would it be the orientation that would matter? So I leave it to that. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Kim, I wonder if I could ask you, um, there have been many times global statements in support uh, of South Korea you know, against North Korea's nuclear weapons program calling for um, support for the declaration on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. What do you find is missing from the international community? What specific ask would you make that would have a material um, effect that could bring North Korea to the table? Is there any one thing that you would, you would say would push yes. North Korea to, into talks? Yes. Uh, the one thing what is most needed is persistence. Mm. So like North Korean strategy is very simple. If I do this again and again and again, then you'll be tired of it and you will ignore it and you will be numb to it. So uh, whenever they do like uh, they violate UN Security Council resolutions, we must condemn it each and every time. So they make it clear that the international community's will is not to allow North Korea to have nuclear weapons. So. And uh, Mr. Little, um, I, I very much appreciate the way you couched your remarks about the ban treaty, acknowledging that other states have a right to defend themselves uh, as they see fit. Um, one of the issues in the ban treaty, however, is that um, by making nuclear weapons illegal, and there are some advocates for the treaty who therefore say that anyone involved in the nuclear deterrent enterprise should be subject to arrest. There, there are some advocates for the ban treaty who are specifically seeking to undermine uh, certain democracies who rely on deterrence. H how would you respond to how the ban treaty is being packaged and sold? I mean, because the way you spoke about it, I thought was very, very rational and very understanding of the sovereign rights of other nations. But there are some advocates who don't appear to share that view. I think it's important um, what the, the, the treaty is about is signaling um, that if we are going to um, have, promote, encourage peace and stability, um, notwithstanding that there is conflict, of course there is conflict and territorial conflict, and that's the nature of uh, humanity um, down through the ages. But if we are going to um, promote it, then we cannot have a technology that um, goes beyond uh, territorial conflict, that has an impact that goes beyond um, just a, a, a conflict in time, that has enduring effects on the environment and on communities and on people and um, causes a displacement of people that is um, uh, seldom properly remedied. So when we understand the magnitude of the um, threat or the peril that we're trying to address, the, the um, treaty uh, 
sets that objective that we must remove the technology from the world. Now, we are realists, and uh, what has to happen has to happen in the real world, but it is about um, setting the objective and finding the mechanisms and the means to achieve the objective, um, respecting the need uh, to accept there is conflict and means to resolve conflict in a way that, um, uh, that allows um, peace to be restored where it needs to be restored and peace to remain the um, principal guideline for the way we uh, communities exist together. I think that I think that's important, and, and not not to be too harsh. But I had an argument with a Bantry supporter, uh, Beatrice Finn, um, where I asked her, "So the India-Pakistan conflict war would be fine with you as long as it wasn't nuclear?" And she said yes. And I found that to be kind of a, a difficult situation. So resolving these conflicts is surely the most important thing. There, there is uh, look. It is one thing to remove a hideous technology. It is another to um, to resolve the, the many conflicts that still remain around the world and many enduring and uh, historical conflicts. And we must never let up on that as well. And uh, I'm not going to attempt to resolve, yeah, sure. provide solutions to all those, but we must have means to, to continue to deal with those. But a technology that has the ability to literally wipe out um, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands at a time, destroy environments, um, cannot be a technology that is the basis of an enduring peace. And finally, for before I open up to the floor, please feel free to queue for questions. Um, Assistant Secretary General, uh, I was wondering, so July, uh, we'll see the Vilnius Summit. Do you see any decisions, any policies, any proposals um, coming up from the NATO Summit that could support Asian security uh, or risk reduction or contribute uh, uh, to peace and stability in this region? Well, we took um, a decision at the Madrid summit last year when we adopted a, a new strategic concept to, to signal more clearly that, uh, as I said, whilst NATO has no intention of, of uh, operating in the Indo-Pacific or expanding into the Indo-Pacific, uh, we recognize that we need to understand what's happening in this region and we need to uh, be involved and engaged. It's why I'm here. It's why the chair of the uh, uh, NATO military committee is here as well. Um, uh, but I think we've, we've, we've established that policy, and what we're now doing is, is implementing it uh, through engagement, developing partnership with, um, uh, uh, well, in particular with New Zealand and Australia, uh, uh, with the Republic of Korea uh, and, and Japan. Um, I don't think there'll be a big shift on that um, at the Vilnius Summit. Um, uh, Vilnius is in many ways about putting into practice the big strategic decisions we took last year. Can I just make one last point, though, and I, and I would very rarely disagree with uh, my, uh, our esteemed New Zealand colleague, but about the ban treaty, because I think the point about setting the objective is, is absolutely right, um, uh, and indeed, you know, all NATO allies are, um, are members of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, so we have set ourselves the objective of eliminating nuclear weapons when conditions allow. The problem that, that, that we and many others have with the ban treaty is that it attempts to delegitimize um, those countries who rely on nuclear deterrence in the meantime. And, and that, I think, is what is, 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 is more problematic. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to take some questions from the floor. Um, and first, I'd like to turn to Ankit Panda. Please uh, introduce yourself and sure. fire away. Thank you, William. Uh, Ankit Panda with the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, William, uh, like you, I've been coming to the Shangri-La Dialogue for a few years, and when we used to hear about nuclear weapons, it mostly used to be in the context of the Korean Peninsula. And so it's great to see this discussion on the broader nuclear dimensions of regional security. Um, I was waiting for the, the subject of China's nuclear buildup to be mentioned, and it, and it was mentioned by our NATO um, participant, of course. And I just wanted to pose a question on uh, intentions, uh, right? We've, we've described the problem and we've admired it uh, with regard to this substantial change uh, in the regional nuclear balance, uh, indeed the global nuclear balance. And I just wanted to kind of hear some perspectives on why China might be doing this. Uh, what exactly is the intention? At the 20th Party Congress, President Xi made one reference in part of a sentence that China must have a strong system of strategic deterrence but we didn't get much more detail, uh, and I'd be very interested in hearing perspectives from uh, any of the speakers on the drivers of this change uh, in China's view of what is necessary 
uh, for nuclear deterrence or, or what's necessary potentially for other ends. Thank you. So I'm going to take three questions at a time. So why don't I turn to one of our Chinese colleagues, uh, John Xiao, please. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about uh, security situation, especially nuclear security situation in this region, what have been missing in the speeches of the panelists? I'd mention, I'd like to mention some things. One is the, the OX. The United States and the United Kingdom provide nuclear powered submarines to Australia. And another one is the Washington consensus. The United States is going to provide extensive deterrence to, to the ROK. And also in 2018, I remember the, the United States has adopted the, the nuclear posture review. And in that document, the United States is going to deploy tactical nuclear weapons in this region. So a lot of things you just uh, you know, omitted these things. So I'd like to, I'd like to you to mention, comment on all these things I have mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for the third comment, uh, I'll take uh, Kim Bergman. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, with your indulgence, a very brief. Please introduce yourself. Oh, oh, sorry, Kim Bergman. I'm the editor of two magazines, Asia Pacific Defense Reporter and Defense Review Asia. Uh, with your indulgence, a very brief comment first, uh, noting the presence of my or our colleague from the Ukraine. I'm not sure that the world properly has acknowledged <coughs> Ukraine giving up nuclear weapons, and, uh, and hopefully that's an example that other countries will follow. So that's a comment. The question is uh, indeed also about Australia's intention to acquire nuclear-powered submarines, because on our current trajectory, the submarines will be uh, fueled by highly enriched uranium, each submarine potentially will have enough HEU to produce dozens of nuclear warheads. Uh, how should the region feel? Is the risk manageable, or could this set a dangerous precedent for other countries to go down the nuclear path using this sort of mechanism? Okay, so now let me turn to our panelists. Um, so. There was a question about the Washington State. <coughs> uh, Ambassador Kim, did you? Yes, uh, yes. I, I made it very clear in my statement that like 10 years ago, uh, North Korea said that their nuclear weapons is for deterrence purpose only. But now they, they have a new law, new, new nuclear policy law last September, which says that they can use their tactical nuclear weapons preemptively against us. So it raises a lot of serious nuclear threat to our people. So we had to do something. And, but we are under the NPT obligation to develop our own nuclear weapons, or our own nuclear capabilities. So what we were able to do was to uh, strengthen the extended deterrence from our ally, the United States. So that is basically what uh, we try to achieve in the Washington declara de Declaration. So uh, I don't see why anybody has any problem with that. Thank you. Would any of the other panelists like to address any of these questions? Minister, please go ahead. Um, just on the issue about um, Australia, given that they're our uh, nearest neighbour and, uh, and ally, um, and I think it's important to get an understanding of the context in which Australia has signed up to the arrangement with the US and the UK under the AUKUS arrangement. It is to acquire nuclear-powered submarines. Part of the context of that is that Australia is a party to the Treaty of Rarotonga, um, which means that they have obligations in relation to not having um, nuclear weapons, nuclear warheads. Um, they... Uh, also a party to um, other um, nuclear non-proliferation agreements, so they are bound by those obligations. In terms of the development of the, the technology and acquiring nuclear-powered submarines, uh, they are 
at least on the basis of their advice to us, working closely with the International Atomic Energy Agency to ensure that the technology that they um, use in the submarines is not um, accessible to uh, for um, nuclear warheads. So we take some comfort from that and of course our historic relationship and connection um, with Australia means we, um, uh, we trust the assurances that they give us. I've been personally very glad at the engagement of the IAEA Director General Raphael Grossi on this question to ensure that um, any such work is in full compliance with Australia's, um, not just the NPT, but their safeguards agreement with the IAEA, uh, additional protocol, et cetera. Yeah, and, and I also think, you know, sort of technically the idea that Australia would suddenly break open the reactors and use the HEU to make weapons is, I, I'm just not sure it's even technically doable, let alone plausible that Australia would act illegally and all that. I just, I, it, it just doesn't make a huge amount of sense. I mean, just, I wanted to come back to the, the question about sort of why China is developing its nuclear program the way it is. And, and I, you know, that's for our Chinese colleagues to answer. It's not, it's not for me to answer. But the point I was making earlier on is that actually it would be helpful um, to answer more of those questions. Um, and, you know, it could, to some extent, that then answers the question that our Chinese friend put to, to, to the panel, which is, you know, why is, um, uh, why is AUKUS happening? Why is um, extended deterrence being uh, uh, strengthened? Um, why is the US NPR looking? It's it, it precisely because those countries see the threat evolving uh, and they see, they see China changing and they see North Korea changing. Um, so this is what I think that exchange underlines my point that we need more transparency and dialogue. And I think it is important to acknowledge Ukraine giving up its nuclear weapons in 1994, as did Belarus and Kazakhstan, and Russia promising to remove nuclear weapons from Belarusian territory, now promising to move them back, which I think is a very dangerous development. Um, and, and, you know, goes to the question on return of tactical nuclear weapons to the region. Um, you know, I think it is very important to make sure that nuclear proliferation does not occur. And one of the questions is how best to maintain deterrence against a North Korea that seems determined to upset uh, the balance. Um, so, you know, I think the cooperation between South Korea and the United States uh, to prevent nuclear war, to prevent North Korea from believing it can initiate and win a nuclear war is something that's important and the development of, of further nuclear weapons. I'd also note that President Xi and President Putin made a statement on March 21st that nuclear weapons should not be stationed outside of national territory. And then Russia, five days later, announced that they were going to do that. And I wonder in my own head, it does, you know, um, how President Xi believes um, President Putin's uh, reversal on that um, has impacted uh, credibility and could impact the view of deployment of weapons in this region as well, but that's an open question. Let me turn to Yongsheng Tang. Next on my list, I have uh, Alia Ali Kazmi, please. Thank you, Chair. Over here. Oh, there you are. Hi. Thank you. I'm Dr. Tiali Kazmi from uh, the Center for International Strategic Studies, Islamabad, Pakistan. Um, I have a question for uh, Mr. Lapsley or Mr. Little. And uh, I would just like to point out towards um, a very important strategic um, um, development in Asia Pacific which is AUKUS, which has already been pointed out by our worthy uh, members over here. And um, my observation is that usually such developments, such uh, any military developments in Asia Pacific have uh, spillovers for other regions as well, most importantly South Asia, which is a subset of Asia Pacific region. So uh, my question has two aspects. One, that uh, how will uh, the addition of uh, nine uh, SSNs to the fleet, which uh, Australia possesses right now, in addition to the mix of extra re regional uh, SSNs uh, in and around littoral waters of the Asia Pacific, will be the harbinger of stability in this region. Uh, 
will it not be an addition to instability and uh, nuclear risk? And the other aspect is that uh, um, how will it be taken by the nuclear powers in South Asia, um, especially given their age-old rivalries? So will it be a message for those uh, powers to um, you know, develop themselves accordingly? by depending more on their friends or allies, which will be interested in helping them. Thank you. Right, <laughs> thank you. And next. Next, I'd like to call on uh, Antoine. Antoine, please. Thank you, William. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Um, my question is for Antoine Levec from the uh, IISS. I'm a research fellow for South Asia. Um, I'd like to um, address my two questions to uh, General Mirza. Um, thank you for your engaging remarks. I was uh, encouraged uh, by uh, your mention of track 1.5 diplomacy as being critical to uh, your region. Uh, I think this is music to uh, the ears of the IISS. I also noted uh, your acknowledgement of the Indo-Pacific notion, and we've just referred here to the Asia-Pacific. I think this is an interesting uh, uh, evolution and a rare acknowledgement. My two questions um, are as follows. The first one relates to nuclear doctrine. Um, I think you mentioned that Pakistan's purpose for possessing nuclear weapons was, quote, uh, fully defensive. You did not mention Pakistan's uh, full-spectrum deterrence, nor did you mention credible minimum deterrence. Were these omissions intentional, or were they only uh, due to lack of time? The second question is about the 2022 missile incident you referred to. Um, I wrote a report with colleagues in 2021 where we assessed that chance had played a role in previous uh, uh, incidents uh, in the region, notably in 2019. And so in light of that, and that uh, 2022 incident, I wonder what Pakistan's uh, lessons learned exercise looks like. Um, what has Pakistan um, determined as being uh, the worthy lessons of that 2022 missile incident? Thank you. Shall we turn to our panelists? Was there any of the questions you'd like to respond to? Anything you heard? Um, well, uh, neither the minister nor I can speak for the AUKUS nations. Um, uh, but what I would say is, is an, you know, what is an SSN? It's, a, it, it's not a submarine with a nuclear attack capability. It's a submarine that can move a long distance much faster than a conventionally powered submarine. That's the fundamental logic of, of uh, having uh, SSNs in that part of the world where the distances are enormous, um, uh, particularly if you're thinking of defending the extended um, sea around um, uh, Australia. So I, 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 from a sort of technical point of view, I don't buy the argument that, that nuclear-powered SSNs are destabilizing of the nuclear um, uh, weapons balance in the region. Um, not much more to add to that. As I understand it, Australia's objective is to have um, <coughs> Uh, a vessel, a submarine, that uh, they can deploy for longer and be on station for longer. They already have submarines, and those submarines are deployed um, in the region, um, but they wish to do so um, for their reasons, they, their strategic reasons that they assess, which includes um, a greater role they wish to play um, in the region with partners, and that's a, a range of partners, not just those in the AUKUS arrangement. Uh, because they're not nuclear armed, they are simply nuclear powered, I don't see that it adds uh, or, or creates a risk in terms of um, the nuclear balance in the region at this point. And as nuclear powered, they would not be able to visit New Zealand ports, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay, thank you. General? <coughs> uh, thank you for your questions. Let me first clarify <coughs> one thing, that uh, it is not subscribing to or accepting the notion of Indo-Pacific. 
In fact, I was very clear when I said that seeking to replace the regionally preferred and historically rooted concept of Asia Pacific. So I would rather, I would say that uh, we, we, we primarily believe in Asia Pacific because you know that better than me that Indo-Pacific is a very notional term which is very restricted up to a certain country and Asia Pacific caters for the complete horizon. And that is why my recommendations also conform to complete Asia, as I said, Asian solutions, not the Indo solutions. So let me clear that, that we are not subscribing, but I was giving its implications that by adopting to Indo-Pacific, what implications and how the nuclear aspect or the nuclear dimension would lurk into. So that was my clarification. Um, as you know, the topic didn't warrant that uh, to be discussed, but you are very well aware about that, that the Pakistan, of course, believes in full spectrum deterrence within the precincts or within the overall policy of credible minimum nuclear deterrence. And the FSD, you know that, is, of course, at the horizontal and the vertical level. And those levels are very much in place. And uh, overall concept draws its strengths from the credible minimum nuclear deterrence. Lastly, I, I hope I've been able to answer. I deliberately did not mention, because I didn't want to go into those details, because the topic was above that scope. I just touched upon our nuclear, uh, the premise of our nuclear, uh, being nuclear. Uh, lastly, 2022 uh, was a very interesting incident and everything is a function of environment. Mm -hmm. And that was the environment in which suddenly you see uh, a missile landing, uh, which could have hit any aircraft, which could have hit anything, and which could have had a human catastrophe. But based on the environment which was prevalent at that moment, there was, it was decided not to respond to that. But that does not guarantee anything for the future. Everything is a function of environment. And whatever the environment is, you know our policy is quid pro quo plus. Mm -hmm. So with the, within the presence of quid pro quo plus, whenever we respond, it would be like that. But ha uh, uh, having a judgment, you know that the cruise missiles are very uh, matured and they are very well matured. And it's a very rare thing. I think it is only one in history that uh, such an errand has occurred. It has never been there before. Uh, there has been no, uh, I don't see any um, uh, such uh, typical uh, uh, similar example in the past as well. So uh, we decided to exercise restraint being a responsible uh, nuclear state within the Committee <coughs> of Nations. But as I said, everything is a function of environment and at, the, at whatever time, if such a thing occurs again, it would be environment which would dictate that. I hope I've been able to answer that. So we're coming towards the end of the time, so we'll do a speed round here. I have five requests for the floor. If you could please be very crisp in your uh, question or statement. First, I turn to Hannah uh, Shalast. Please introduce yourself. Hello, Hannah Shalast, Ukrainian PRISM. Um, briefly, uh, don't you think that in this conversation we are missing one very important trend that uh, arose the last year? Because we are usually uh, separate the issues of weapons of mass destruction, nuclear non-proliferation from this classical uh, 20th century uh, dimension, and uh, uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, oh, yes. What to do when the uh, civilian object of critical infrastructure is becoming militarized or used for the terrorist approach, either as threatening it with the weapons or stationing just in the engines, for example, the uh, personal and equipment. Because it seems to me that from this perspective, that can be important both for the aggression, for the terrorism, and for the question of not only those who possess nuclear weapons who are under the conventions, but also also those who are used just for the peaceful nuclear. And such an important question in a region where there are so many nuclear power plants. So uh, excellent question. Thank you very much. Next, I have uh, Chu Ping Hu. Yes, uh, thank you so much, William. So my question is really about how uh, to bridge the gaps between oh, the... I'm so sorry. Could you introduce yourself, please? Oh, so sorry. Uh, I'm Chu Ping from uh, National University of Malaysia. So my question is really about the type of a nuclear norm building that is clearly missing in the Indo-Pacific region. So uh, how do the panelists view uh, the need to bridge the gaps uh, between the countries? And as uh, the previous uh, uh, intervention made very clear as well, so it's not only about the nuclear weapons uh, command and control uh, transparency, but also about how the non-nuclear weapon states like uh, New Zealand and also Southeast Asia, which also have a nuclear weapons free zone treaty, 
ability to uh, provide a basis or foundation to uh, have dialogue with one another. And also, of course, lastly, on the uh, peaceful use of nuclear power, which clearly also owned by Japan, South Korea, and many others. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I have uh, Alistair Gale, please. Thank you. Uh, Alistair Gale with The Wall Street Journal. I have two quick questions, if I may, to, firstly to Mr. Lapsi. Uh, you mentioned that NATO is open to engaging China on nuclear arms, talks about nuclear uh, arms reduction. Um, is this something now, given that there's a lack of dialogue between the US and China, that NATO should take the initiative and, and uh, make the approach to China for talks on that issue? And then quickly, if I may, to Mr. Kim. Um, uh, several previous South Korean administrations have attempted an approach of using pressure on North Korea. Um, what makes you think that this time it will be different, particularly given that Russia is likely to be less cooperative? Uh, and when we're talking about things like uh, the workers, um, many of them are based there. Thank you. Very, very good question. Next, uh, Nigel Gould Davies, please. Nigel Davis, a senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia here at the IISS. Uh, a question prompted by comments from my former colleague, Angus Lapsley, although others may wish to offer a view as well, including you, William. I think you're interested in this. So, Angus, you drew uh, the very clear distinction between NATO as a regional alliance on the one hand uh, and having legitimate and indeed deepening interest in, um, as we've just been reminded, engagement with other parts of the world. I suspect one of the emerging themes of this conference will be the extent to which European and Asian theatres will become increasingly enmeshed. Uh, in this context, I wonder in practice how feasible it is to maintain that distinction, in particular if you're able to offer any thoughts on the reports uh, that, uh, that NATO may open uh, an office in Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Kim, did you want to come back in? I have a few. Yes, please, go right ahead. Uh, yes, I apologize for phrasing my question so badly. I, I wasn't asking about Australia acquiring nuclear weapons. That's not going to happen. I was asking about the precedent that this sets. What is now to stop any other country going down the nuclear weapons path by acquiring submarines powered by highly enriched uranium? OK, excellent. Um, so we'll take that as the final set of questions. So I will turn to each um, of our speakers uh, in the order uh, that we started. Uh, but I just did want to, to give you a direct answer on that. Um, Brazil has a program for uh, nuclear fuel for submarines. And they reserve the right to enrich up to 99% should they choose to. And because it's under safeguards, because this is clear understanding. So the precedent is out there. Um, um, and as long, I think, as long as Australia continues to work directly with the Board of Governors and with Raphael Grossi, that it sets an excellent precedent for the future that everything that's done has to be done under um, verifiable and complete safeguards. So, General, may I speak? please turn to you first. Yeah, I'll just uh, respond to that, what you said. Uh, India and Pakistan, for example, have a very, uh, out of the three CBMs we have in uh, place, uh, although there are many which are still not in place, uh, one of those uh, CBMs is related to non-attack on each other's uh, nuclear facilities and installations. And uh, as a precedent for the last uh, so many years since they have been signed, on the 1st of January every year, we share the list of the facilities and the installations uh, to each other. And uh, it's a very, very matured mechanism which is there. So I think that is a precedent which can Excellent. be uh, taken for, uh, care of. Uh, your comment about Brazil, I'll just want to add one thing. But you must know that Brazil is indigenous. Mm -hmm. While it has a highly interest uranium, but it is indigenous. So that is one point which is there. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, the, 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 the alternate thought mm -hmm. to AUKUS is that it is not indigenous in its character as it should be. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Minister, please. Uh, a, a couple of points for me to respond to. One from um, Chu Ping Lu from Malaysia. I think your question about non-nuclear <coughs> countries and the relationship with um, nuclear powers. And we have, and uh, we have very strong relationships with um, uh, nuclear-armed countries. We have long-standing historical relationships with the U.S. 
um, with the UK, uh, with France, and um, in the in the South Pacific. Um, so we maintain um, defence relationships with them. We maintain, therefore, a dialogue with them, and we stay in touch and urge responsibility um, in terms of that. Um, and then the other important thing is, of course, the role we play in uh, the various non-proliferation forums and the treaties which we've signed up to, and we continue to champion uh, those causes. Um, and then the second point I want to make, again, in response to Mr Bergman, the, question, the precedent being set, um, and of course it um, presupposes the precedent being set, and the precedent being set is a non-nuclear state um, with obligations under a variety of non-proliferation treaties, wishes to uh, have the use of a technology or nuclear-powered um, uh, vessel or vessels, submarines, um, and they are doing so while also meeting their non-proliferation obligations. That is an, an, um, a useful precedent to set, uh, and Australia is doing that. Ambassador? Yes, uh, what is different this time? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, when we look back history of the last 30 years, uh, it's that we first, the, the international community pressure North Korea to denuclearize, and we make, we make it very clear that we cannot accept nuclear North Korea. And at some point, North Korea comes back to the table that they have intention to denuclearize and we made agreements several times, but then they reneged. Uh, so it's the history of 30 years. So what's the difference this time? But what I'd like to stress is that for the last 30 years, what happened to North Korea? That I already told you that their economy is more, it's bankrupt almost. And, and their security is more undermined. And like uh, they are internationally more isolated. For instance, like 20 years ago, 10 years ago, they have trade with every country, or almost many countries in the world, but now their trade is 99.9% .9 with China only. So there's, there are difference of situations. So we'll, we'll try this time again, until they denuclearize. So. Secretary General, you have the last word. Thank you. Um, so, great point about uh, Russia's um, uh, uh, attacks on, on civilian nuclear power. And I think it, draw, it, it illustrates a, a wider point from this conflict, which is the use of conventional capabilities in a way that potentially has strategic implications. And another example would be the, uh, the extensive use of cruise missiles and, uh, and ballistic missiles as a conventional weapon, uh, which, uh, were this to be a conflict between two nuclear powers, would be a very worrying situation um, to be in. So great point. Um, look, NATO is open to dialogue with China. We cannot possibly substitute for US China dialogue. That's 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 the most important uh, part of this. We 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 can't and wouldn't try and substitute for that. Uh, on sort of the enmeshment point from from Nigel, yeah, I mean, look, we we, as I said, we are we are not uh, we're not part of the um, Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific um, uh, uh, setup. Our, our, our job is Euro-Atlantic security, but there are so many issues which are common to the two regions now. And we've touched on quite a lot of them today. We could also have talked about space. We could have talked about climate change. We could have talked about resilience. There's a whole bunch of issues where we face similar issues. And therefore, we can learn from each other. We can understand where precedents might be setting or uh, uh, happening. So that's what we're trying to do. And certainly, the, the, the dialogue with, um, with Japan is one of the most intense, uh, uh, um, but not just Japan, also with, uh, with the other countries. And lastly, now I do understand the question from <laughs> Mr. Bergman. Sorry for getting that wrong earlier. Look, I think if you were trying to help another country acquire a nuclear weapon, there are much more easy ways of doing it than selling them an SSN. Um, and you wouldn't sell an SSN to a country if you had any doubt about what they were going to do with it. Well, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, and could you please join me in a round of applause for our speakers for doing an excellent job on some very difficult topics.